Hi everyone, and welcome to this week's Pirate Podcast with me, Mike Jones, aka Captain Pirate. And this week I've got a, a different kind of guest to my usual ones, an actual young person. <laughs> We've all been oldies, all the ones before. No offence to the ladies that have been on, obviously. But there's Jack Davidson. He's a, a young Welsh professional golfer, fantastic player, uh, played on the Walker Cup as well. So you know that's an achievement. So welcome to the show, Jack. Welcome on board. Thank you, Mike. Nice to be here. So uh, we, we met at the at the Celtic Manor playing some golf down there, but I never realised that I knew your dad, Crunchy. Oh, really? I, I really didn't. And I played against him and all played when I played for Woodlinks yeah. and everything, but uh, I had no idea that was he <laughs> the inspiration, Crunchy, that got you into golf? Yeah, uh, my dad and my granddad, really. Um my mum also played a bit of golf when she was younger, so oh, it's right. a bit of a golf. Yeah, it's a bit of a golfing family. So, my dad mainly though, because he he played to a decent level himself, and taking me down the golf club with him when I was a lot younger, obviously, had an impact on me and starting the game that way. I never beat him, mate. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> he's too good for me. <laughs> I think when I started beating him is when we last played, really, when I was about 13, and that was it. <laughs> well, why you don't tell me he doesn't take shots off you, does he? Oh, no, no, he wouldn't do that. It would hurt his self esteem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you were both, you both played at, uh, it was Lamwern, wasn't it? Was yes, Lamwern yeah. your home club? Yes, yeah, I grew up at Lamwern. Um, obviously, my dad playing there and my granddad, so that was just easy for me. Uh, the Celtic was only up the road, but if, if I was there on my own, it would probably wouldn't have been such a help as it was down line where I'm being around family and friends and stuff. So it's a bit of a community like that. All right. it's, it's so important to have the uh, su- support systems in. But uh, yeah. just to let you, like, the, the people who were listening know, uh, Jack's dad was a really good, he played county, obviously, as well. You know, county player, first team player at Lamwern, top, top player. And uh, he... He carried for you as well. Was that right? When you when you first like the Water Cup and you first turned pro, was he caddying for you as well? Yeah, he started caddying for me um, sort of the last year of my amateur golf in the UK, only because um, you know they're long weeks, they're tough courses, and having that extra experience really does help. And so when I turned professional, it was quite an easy transition just to, to carry on using him. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to caddy at the Walker Cup because we were, you know, supplied caddies, yeah. there, local caddies. But uh, yeah, I did use him for the first few events um, as I turned pro, uh, which was an experience upon itself, you know, as me turning yeah. pro into the world and, and him being there with me was obviously a very cool experience. It's a new dynamic, isn't it, I suppose, as well. You know, your father and son relationship becomes yeah. a professional relationship. That must have uh, been a bit yeah, strange, was- I would have thought. It was strange, but we tried to treat it as much as a job as we could. Even as amateurs, like um, we wouldn't stay in the same hotel. We would try not even to travel up together because, you know, we're trying to separate the father son into a yeah. you know a golf and caddy relationship, which which was a challenge. But we did the best we could, and you know we got so far. And then I think it comes to a stage where, you know, the the professional side of it has to take ownership. Precedent, and, yeah, yeah, and. You know, it just it just was that way, and we had to to part ways at a certain point. And yeah. you know, it didn't affect our father son relationship in any way. It was just personally. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it would. He's a he's a top man. Like, but yeah, I the, re- the reason I, I I was asking that is I, I was watching the Masters, and I, there was a lot of commentary about Lee Westwood, McElroy, um, uh, Spieth, where they've all yeah. got either friends or close family on the bag, and yeah. I I. I I think later in your career, that can be a good thing to show you what's important. But at the beginning, I, I really like the idea see, with McElroy, and I've said this on the podcast before, I think if he could have had a caddy like Steve Williams now, he yeah. would become like, and yeah. he would, I think it would take him to another level because there's someone to stand up to him on his decision making, not his best mate, so to speak, on the bag, but Someone who's going to yeah. say, "What are you doing? You can do that. Yeah. You have, you know, got all that experience." I think. What? What do you think that would work for him, or did, did it um, make a big difference to you when you when when you changed? Yeah, I think caddy is is really personal to the player. I mean, some players uh, go with the relaxed approach, taking friends and stuff, and 
you know, when you're at home, you, you find out how you play your best and that could be with mates or it could be, you know, you play with the best player at the club and they really bring out the best of you. And that, that does relate into caddies. And you find now a lot more players taking their friends out with them because they are more relaxed around them and, and they can, you know, enjoy the life of traveling yeah. and playing at, at the same time. But then you have the, you know, the likes of Steve Williams, who is so professional, he might bring out more in players, especially yeah. off the golf course in, in driving them in practice and stuff like that. Yeah. And I've experienced, um, you know, both ends of the spectrum with those caddies where my second event as a pro, my management company managed to get hold of Rafa Cabrera Barrow's caddy, who caddy from in the Ryder Cup to, to yeah. know, you know, be on the bag for me that week at Q score. And although he's, you know, experienced such a fantastic caddy, but because we didn't have any relationship, he didn't know about me or vice versa. It's yeah. hard then to get the trust and the relationship into each other, yeah. which a caddy and the player need to have. And, you know, it, it does go both ways. Oh, it, it, it must be so difficult because we all talk about how great plays you are. And I, I, I played you and I see how good you are and how good you hit the ball. But we, sometimes us as spectators forget how much goes in to the other side of the game. And yeah. it's, I, I'm trying to think of the best way to, to, to put it. It was, it can give you like a better focus, I think, sometimes. Having someone there with experience or a mate, this this the ideal caddy would be Steve Williams, but he happens to be your best mate. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> if you know what I mean, that would be the perfect, the yeah, perfect I mean, scenario. The, the situations on a course where you know if your mate's on the bag and they've seen you play and pull off certain shots that you're capable of doing, that they allow you to go ahead and do it. But certain caddies might never have seen you pull off these shots, so might not have the the trust and, and the you know the go ahead to do it so yeah, there, there is swings in. and roundabouts yeah so there is swings and roundabouts still to both but I'm sure you know the experienced caddy would take precedence in especially in nervous situations going down the stretch. So I, I heard you saying earlier that um, Q school you you, you did school uh, Q school but uh, the what it was it was part of that when we had a conversation about your scoring where you played with two other guys who didn't have great clubs. I think one was plus two, one was plus three. Uh, it might be a challenge tour event you played in and you were minus one, minus two. And when you finished the round, you thought, yeah, I've, I've done all right there. I've done really well. And you see that there's six guys shot eight and there's 70 shot. Yeah. Did, did you feel as though that was a like a l real good lesson for you to just focus on what you're doing and chase those scores or yeah I, I, uh, the difference I found in that is in amateur golf we play such high like tough courses in tough conditions that it doesn't almost prepare you for low scores so when you do right. shoot a few yeah. under par it's like you know it's an achievement um, yeah. but then when you step into the professional game and you're not used to these eight, nine, ten under par rounds that it's a bit of a shock that when you shoot a couple under you're so far behind um from yeah, the get-go like that would, that would, that's the bit that would yeah. frazzle me so but, then it uh, makes you it makes you guess then how do you go about each round and start in a tournament and do you play aggressive or do you carry on playing the way you've been um so it, it does take a while to get used to it but i think that's why in america you see the younger players getting off to a faster yeah. start in professional careers because in college golf they do you know they shoot yeah. those scores and it prepares yeah. you for the pga tour Whereas oh, obviously in the UK, we don't get that. Well, th this is the other thing I remember. Like, I, I, I think that you've changed dr uh, dramatically in your approach. And, the, and the, the, this is the reason I'll, I'll say it now. When you were shooting scores, and like you said, we played a couple of times, and I could see all the potential. And then I, I remember that conversation where like, you, you felt you played well, and then it was a, like a wake-up call, right, I need to do this. Yeah. And I spoke to Reese and uh, Louis Sanjis. Uh, this was months back, you know, in, before the last lockdown. And they said, wow, like Jack just gone around the 2010, the Ryder Cup course, nine under. And I thought, yeah. that's it. That's, that's the p real potential of what you can achieve. And that must have been, wow. You know, I know it's only a knock with your mates, but nine under is nine under. You still got to bloody do it. Yeah, yeah, you, know you, you remember I mean? those rounds. Yeah, definitely. It was one of them days where, you know, putts were dropping. Um, 
the ball was on the string off the tee. And you, that, those are the days you've got to take advantage of it yeah. and make the most of those low scores. And, you know, you don't get many days like that in the year where you shoot nine under on the 2010s. So uh, I definitely remember <laughs> <Yeah>. that one. <laughs> but, uh, well, the other thing is it just drives you on and you know you can do it. It's all, it's, they go on about this reinforcement all the time in the psychological side. So the next time you're sort of seven under on a course, you think, well, I'm not, I'm not scared again at the nine or 10 under yeah. because I've, d- I've, I've done it. Where I exactly. saw so many like scratch players or decent players at our club where they would get three under with four to play and they'd be going, oh, if I can just par in now, I'll shoot 68 or something. And instead of, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm three under, if I can birdie the last two, I can get a five under. Yeah, and yeah. There's hardly any of them think that way. No, so, uh, no they, they, when, they, they're marking the card before they finish most of the time. In, well, uh, that's in it. Level. Uh, you know? did, did, so when you first broke par, did it just come to you? Because some players it just comes to, and others they have to go through yeah. that and get close and mess it up, get close, mess it up before they actually do it. So yeah, were I you think, the straight in doing it, or did um, it take a bit I think of time? The, the first time I broke par was actually away from Lamwern, so um, I can't remember where it was. But it was almost, um, it felt like it had been coming, even though yeah. it was, I was quite a, a young age, it would have probably been four, 13, 14 when I broke par. But it then felt like, you know, I'm able to do it. This is the normal. I should be doing it. And then you start yeah. to do it more often and it doesn't become anything. Then it's what, what can I beat? And what's your best yeah. score? One under, then you try to get two, three, four under par, you know, and it's exciting then when you try and beat yeah. your, your previous round and especially at a young age where you know I was around golfers who were doing the same thing at my age and it, was, it wasn't so much a shock it was like this is what we should be doing if we want to be professional golfers these are the scores you got to shoot no matter how old you are and so so you knew yeah. quite young then that you wanted to be a pro yeah golf was always my uh, my first choice and what I wanted to do as a career it was always you know golf over school which probably wasn't yeah. the best idea but well, um, all the all the like you said, the college guys in America, half of them don't graduate, yeah, because yeah. they say, "No, I want to get on tour now. I'm good enough. I'm going," because the college yeah, system is so good, and not many of them actually graduate. No, I know you see them getting younger and younger now on tour, and it's only because the ability level is so high that you know you don't need to wait to graduate. If you're ready, you're ready, and you see these boys getting out there straight away. Yeah, oh, that's just awesome. I know I, I, we spoke very briefly at the beginning then about what cup you mentioned it i mentioned it sorry and you say your dad couldn't carry but the walker cup that's that's the pinnacle of all the amateur apart from winning the individual titles like say the british amateur or the united states amateur being a walker cup player that's that's our amateur version of the rider cup so tell us the story of like was it a qualification that you had to go through to get it and you had that phone call or was it uh do they do a wildcard system i know nothing about the qualification process for the walker cup right um the walking there's no there's no qualification for it it's it's 10 players selected by um four selectors is is a selector from each country scotland england Ireland, and wales um and basically they just pick it off merit and form and world ranking and stuff like that so uh, at the start of the year in 2017, I wouldn't have been in with a shout or, you know, wouldn't have been on the list. And uh, I went to the Spanish Amateur, which is one of the highest ranked events we play in, the, in Europe, managed to win there, um, which then really put my name out there and put my name yeah. forward, you know, in, into the bubble, say. Um, and then followed the form up with uh, a win the following week in the Euro Nations. Um, and then as I won there on the 18th green, one of the selectors from the Walker Cup approached me and said, you know, congratulations, you're in the Walker Cup squad, wow. which is a 20, which is a 20 man team. It doesn't mean you're in the team. It means you're in the squad. So I was, yeah. even by that, I was happy enough. Oh, good God. Yeah. And then, so the season progressed and obviously you don't know who's going to play and who's not. So as each player, there's a new winner each week. So you think, oh, well, he's going to be in the team. He's going to be in the team. <laughs> So it's really hard to get your head down and focus on your own golf because all you're thinking about is, you know, playing in the Walker Cup. <laughs> so it came to a stage through the middle of the season where I had a 
chat with my coach and you know I felt like I played myself into the team and then sort of I was just drifting maybe back out of it with form so he said well we had a chat about the Welsh amateur was the last um, tournament I would have played before selection and he said you know he's gonna have to go and win the Welsh amateur so obviously it put a bit of pressure on that I was just gonna say no pressure yeah (laughs) it, it did put a bit of pressure on it but I knew myself you know I had to win that week to to get selected and Luckily enough, you know, I found some good form uh, that really suited the course, Abu Dhabi. And um, I, I managed to win, win the final eight and seven. And then I had the, the phone call that, you know, I'm selected to play yeah. in the Walker Cup. Well, the, the one thing I'll say you, Jack, is I was lucky enough to hit form. Don't say that, mate. You know, that is the hardest thing in golf to do is when you've got to, it's all, you've got to do it. And you go out and do it. And there's not many that do that. Like Rick, Ricky Fowler had to win the uh, Valero, was it to get in the Masters to keep his streak alive? And yeah. he couldn't, and these are pros, couldn't do it. So yeah. you knew that pressure was on and you've gone out there and performed it. That must be such a, a confidence booster and make you feel right. I'm really got a place in this. But then yeah. the, you, your water cap was the away match, wasn't it, in America, in the States? Yeah, so yeah, we came up against um, Colin Morikawa, Cameron Champ, Will Zalatoris, who's just finished second in the Masters yesterday, oh, Scotty God. Shuffler. <laughs> so probably the no best. No mugs then. <laughs> no, no mugs at all. Probably the best USA team they've ever had in the Walker Cup, I think. Um, but that was, a, that was a challenge on its own, you know, going to, the, to LA to play in the Walker Cup against such a big team who you know, had big, big experience, big results in amateur yeah. golf. And, you know, it was a week I won't forget, but uh, I, I wish we could redo it. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you think you would approach it different, differently mentally? Um, this time, I would think... you, knowing what you know now, you know you could play the golf they play, did that, so was there like psych, that psychological element to it when you were out there? That, did I, you think, ever, I think there was. You know, did the team feel... Um, I don't know the the most. There's no polite way of putting it, but did you feel the Americans were better? Maybe subconsciously that might have been in there. You didn't really understand how good you all were. Could could do you think that played a part in it, or do you know top um, amateur golfers think that way? I think there there was um, an aura around that American team that made That's them the feel. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There were definitely was that around them that made them feel a bit more superior, I would say, yeah. than us. Um, even though we felt like we had we were going there to win to, to retain the trophy, that you know, we're coming up against a side here that you know they, they're taking nothing for granted, they're here to win, as were we, but they just yeah. had that, you know, grip between the teeth that they were there and they mean business this week. And I think for us it was more of a taking it all in, you know, happy to be here. Whereas yeah, I don't I think we you. had, you know, the the killer instinct that week to to beat them. Uh, that it must have, like all these things must stand you in great stead though now, because that experience under your belt, you're going on. Oh, well, we were maybe we were a bit in trepidation going over, but having stood toe to toe with them and played with like these guys are at the top of the professional game now. So it's yeah. a, I think it's a bit unfair on the European boys. They don't get the same opportunities. I feel as the American boys, because we've got players there who can do everything that they do. And yeah. we just need to give them, in Europe, may not support, may, might not be the right word, but get some structures in place so that our college, we, we develop a golf sort of college system because we tend to lose the best of our talent. Off it goes to the States, and they might go, if they're good enough, they might go straight PGA Tour. There's not yeah. many come the other way. So maybe there's yeah. a bit of a disbalance there, but... I don't want to get into trouble by giving opinions on anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> See that to me, I'm an old man. They can't do that. <laughs> but I'm 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 a senior now, and I where you said you you won the Welsh at Abu Dhabi, so I'm playing in Abu Dhabi now in June in the Welsh Senior, the closed one. Okay. So just for just for Welshies, because I'm yeah. two point five now, so I managed to get in. I don't know whether oh, I'll do brilliant. any good, but uh, yeah. I'm re- I'm really looking forward to it. Because yeah, the the other one that I've been mentioning is the world handicap system. So it doesn't affect you, obviously. But what it will do for you is when we play at the 2010 now, 
you'll be all the way back where the, pro, <laughs> the pros play from. And I can actually play off the Reds now. So the last few oh, really? runs I've had there, I've played off the Reds. So it's right. 5,800 yards, which is the normal yardage for my disabled tournaments. And I right. tell you what, mate, I've loved it because I'm hitting shots from where you where you yeah. drive it. So like, <laughs> just so, the, so everyone listening knows. So when me and Jack play, if we're off the yellows on the first, for example, at the 2010, if I hit, it's 440 yards, I think. If I hit a really good drive, I've got 180, 190 left, like a five wood, three wood. And Jack has just flown these bunkers on the corner of a dog leg and he's flicking a 60, 70 yard shot. In. So that's the, <laughs> that's the difference. But playing off the reds now, I can drive it over the corner, over these bunkers. Yeah. And uh, yesterday I have 125. And it was so oh, nice man. to hit a short iron into that hole because... I, I I felt like I was playing it like you guys. So it was only the tee shots I was missing out on. The rest of it I was playing, like obviously yeah. not the same irons as you, but similar sort of distances. And I tell you, what, yeah. I really really enjoyed it. Didn't all the putt, couldn't all the putt save my life. <laughs> but uh, the greens in in the Wales, they are oh, definitely. No. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> one of our one of our associate clubs uh, at Great Days Golf is Wood Lakes. Now I oh, yeah. played up there a few times since lockdown's finished. The greens are just fantastic. But really? you've, you've played team golf there, no doubt. They, they are so slopey, but they're slick. As you like, even now, after, you know, normally that's the middle of summer for most courses, but they like it now. Like, oh, you just got to get used to missing three-foot putts because it's so tricky. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, that, maybe that's what messed me up. I, I <laughs> so um, what, the, this season now, Jack, it's all obviously been disjointed for the professional game, but what's your plans going forward over the next couple of months? Have you got many tournaments lined up? Yeah, so obviously it's been... It's, it's hit the, the mini tours sort of a lot harder than obviously the PGA Tour and the European Tour the last 12 months. So we haven't managed to play much golf at all, which has been a bit of a shame. But luckily now this year we're, we're going as planned and the Euro Pro Tour starts uh, the middle of May and we run 15 events straight through to October. Wow. Um, and then we got some mini tours starting next week now in the UK, which are just one day, two day events to get yeah. the players warmed up and, you know, get us ready for the season. So yeah, we're basically starting now and, you know, we've had a long winter and even long last year getting ready for it. So, you know, it's, it's a good time coming and I'm very excited to get going. Do you, will you get any challenge tour starts this year? Because I think before lockdown, you played a few challenge tour events, didn't you? Because you walk the cup uh, status. Do you think that'll happen this year for you? Yeah, I mean, we can push we can push for challenge tour events, but w the mistake we made before is actually playing both tours. Um, uh, right. And the hardest part is, you know, is to get into the top 15 or the top five on, on either tour. And to do that, you have to play every event. You know, you can't be switching between both because you, right. you're almost dropping points on each tour then so the the focus will be euro pro as i have full status on that yeah. tour um because you know i'm not going to make the mistake of flittering between both again because even though the challenge tour has bigger priority and, and it's bigger tour it can yeah. almost derail you from your career in some respects if you have poor weeks so yeah. you're, you're, it's easier just to focus on one and, and commit to one. That, that makes a lot. That makes a lot of sense. You know your goals. You know where you are. You don't beat yourself up if you have a bad week then because you've always got the following week where you might have a yeah. bad week and then the following week you're in challenge tour. And it, and it makes total sense losing points. Yeah. When you could be gaining those points that you've gained on the challenge tour could be enough on the Euro Pro to get you to the, like the grand finals or... Exactly. And how many places gave full status on Challenge Tour? Is it the top ten or top fifteen of Euro? Top fifteen on the Euro on the Challenge Tour gets you a European Tour card, um, and yeah. obviously they have the Q score at the end of the year, which is again, it was usually top twenty five um, in the final stage get you a European Tour card, but they've dropped it now to top twenty, so twenty people. But the are, Euro uh, Pro to get. Challenge tour status. What's the top finishes you need in top the Euro five. Pro? So top, top five. five. So, but I, like I've seen you, the results you've had in there, and they beat because you did you you qualify for the grand final. Of, am I mistaken? Did you qualify for the the final? You know, the one with out of the order of merit on the Euro Pro a while ago. Yeah, I've, a year I've, or two ago. Uh, 
I've played both grand finals I've been a pro at for the Euro Pro. I, I managed to get to the final on a very few select starts because I played a lot of Challenge Tour events in 2018. Yeah. So I only managed to play a few Euro Pro events, but managed. I had good results and got me to the grand final. Um, that must and then be I, making you... Uh... Like chomp, you must be chomping at the bit then, because Euro Pro now you now you know what you're gonna do. You can yeah, just go. Yeah. And, it's it's like right. I know what I'm doing. I'm off and I'm gonna like smash it. Yeah, I, I I am. You know, it's it's been a long time and too long, really. Especially at a young age in your career, like you you want to be playing all the time, week in week out. So to have the opportunity now that we're gonna have is is what we need. And you know it. it we practice all the time, but practice isn't the same as competing. So exactly, you know, I, I yeah. can't, can't wait to get back out there. Oh, brilliant. And uh, Q School, you've de- you, you had a go at Q, Q School a uh, year before, is it year before last? I'm trying to think when it, you, you can tell us anyway. And uh, what was that experience like Q School? Is it as tough as, as everyone says it is? Yeah, Q School is, is brutal. Like I played, um, I played 2018, got through first stage quite easily um, and then got to second stage and lost in a playoff um, at second stage where five oh. of us were playing for three spots, um, which was, which was brutal, you know, like all you got to yeah. do is get through that week and then, you know, you've got four good rounds ahead of you. So that, that, that wasn't the easiest to take. And then the following year I came down with food poisoning. I won the first stage and then got the second stage and come down with food poisoning. Oh my God. <laughs> so, I haven't had the best of luck so far at yeah. Q School, so hopefully this year it turns around. Yeah. And oh, it, so you, so you'll still go me. for so you play Euro Pro and try and get status on Challenge Tour, but in the background at the end of the year you'll still go Q School for European Tour. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, oh, brilliant, mate. Oh, I tell you what, Jack, it's been great. It's such an insightful to, to you what goes on one in a top amateur's mind at the top of their game, and then as trying to build and forge a career as a young professional. Uh, was there anybody that our viewers might know that has helped you out at all? You know, any advice? We've got some great Welsh players that have come here that are on the senior tour now. Any of those reached out to you to help you? Yeah, um, I, I'm quite friendly with Phil Price. So I've played a lot of golf with Phil and he's been quite helpful in my career and given me advice. But the main one is Ian Woosnam. Um, as you know, you know, you're friendly with Ian and uh, I am myself that uh, he's great with with young players and, and helping us develop our game. And I built up a bit of a connection with Ian a couple of years ago where I went over to stay with him in his house in Jersey and we played a few rounds together. And there was just some spark and connection we had with each other that built up this relationship that we still have to this day where um, he's kind of a mentor to my game. And, you know, we speak pretty regular that uh, he has all the belief and that I have in myself that I can go all the way. And, you know, without players and professionals like Ian who have been there and seen it, done it all, that makes you really realise, you know, that we, you know, we have got the game and we can go as far as we want to with backing and belief from, you know, former world number one. Yeah. I, when, when, he, when, when, I, when I spoke to him about you, he was, he was so excited about what you could do because like the listeners will know this, but when, when, because I played with Jack and saw what he was doing, I, I couldn't believe how he was. I, I would be right in saying it's the modern golf swing you've got with very little hand action, rotational forces, and he'd hit a ball with his driver. It was, you know, you know, it's going to go 300 yards or there or thereabouts. And I'm waiting for that bit of flight change. Like, was he going to draw a bit at the end or fade a bit at the end? Like I'd seen with all the other like low, low players at the Celtic. No, Jack, it was just straight. And I thought, well, when's he going to whip one offline? Or when's he not going to whip one out of the out of the <laughs> middle of the club? You know, and that's what blew me away when I saw you play was how consistent that strike was, square in the face, getting it online. And I and I, I think it's is it Neil Matthews? Is does he coach you? Yeah, Neil's my coach. Is he your yeah. coach? Because, yeah. like, I, I'm a, I love the technical side of it. And Neil seems to me as though he's very technical. And then when I watch you play, I think, my God, I, that's why I want to do it. <laughs> I want to yeah. get technically that good that I can just repeat <laughs> it the way you do. Uh, so do you think that's what draw Woozy to helping you out when he actually saw you play? 
Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, our game's kind of relating that we're both strong hitters of the ball. And obviously, Ian's one of the best hitters of, of all time. So um, he had this sort of close feeling to my game that it was very similar to his when he was younger. So I think that's what drew him, you know, to help me get better. And, you know, he gave me some advice in the swing a few years back that I still use to this day, which is very simple advice, but it seems to work very efficiently. So you just, it's, it's a different you've, approach you've, from a technical you've got to side. Share it. You've got to share it with us. You've got to tell <laughs> us what his super tip is. I'll be in my garage now. I'm going to go. <laughs> he, uh, he, Ian's very, you know, he keeps it very simple in the golf swing and he just gave me this tip of, when you take the club back is that you get you feel as if like you're say, shaking someone's hand in the backswing with your left hand and then on the way through you're shaking someone's hand with your right hand it was as simple as that is wow. straight back straight through and but it's a shaking feeling. hands it's a feeling that we players have and wow. you know it, it's it, if you can relate to the feeling it works a dream <laughs> yeah Oh, well, that's, that's why you'd, well, I'll be in the garage now after when we finish. <laughs> I'll, have, I'll break a couple of windows, I expect. <laughs> um, the other one, you were, like, luckily enough, we, we, well, we were supposed to go to Jersey last year before the, uh, the situation happened, which was unfortunate. Very woozy. This is how generous the guy is. Very kindly offered me to go over with Jack. And I, I was so disappointed that we couldn't go. But he stayed in touch. He's he said, "Yeah, it's going to happen," and I'm really, really excited about getting over there and playing some golf with him. Because I, I sat at the range at the Celtic when he played in the Welsh Open years and years ago, and I was just watching him just draw, 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 fade, fade, fade to total control, no effort. He could have stayed there for three hours. I wouldn't have drawn a sweat. Up. So yeah, I, I understand that the the practice side of it. He's put so much time in. Do you enjoy your practice or do you find, sometimes find that you'd rather play or are you a range person? Uh, no, I'm definitely a, an on-course playing person. I, I like competing. Um, I like playing, you know, games, matches against people because I feel like it brings out the best in me. Um, you know, I, I almost like being on the back foot a little bit so it can test, test my game and my challenge. So I do like the range, but only only at times where, you know, if the course is too wet or it's too windy to play, you know, I'll, I'll definitely go to the range and practice, but I prefer to play and, you know, and get in the heat of things. Oh, brilliant. Well, I know you like the competitive stuff because, like, I won't tell them a story about when we first played and I, I, whiz, <laughs> I, I swizzed you out of five shots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was a bit naughty. I was off eight at the time, and Jack this is the first time you played. And we said, "Come on, we'll play some match play. How many shots are you going to give me?" And Jack yeah. says, I'll, "I'll give you all of them. I'll give you eight shots. Really generous." And I went, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! What were you off when you turned pro, Jack?" And it was like plus six <laughs> plus four. or something. Yeah. Well, plus, plus four. And I said, "Well, I'm sorry, but my math has twelve shots." And he <laughs> reluctantly agreed. And needless to say, I, I won that match. But then. He was yeah. wise to that trick, and you give me quite a few <laughs> factorings after that. That's yeah. what I think I might have fired, put a bit of fire in your belly, and you decided I'm not going to put up with any of this crap off him anymore. I'm just going to kick his ass. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, good Jack, days, Ava. It's, uh, our time is coming to an end, unfortunately. It's been great chatting with you. Uh, I wish you all the very best, and everyone at Great Days Golf wishes you all the best. Hopefully, you can get on our European tour and fly the flag for Wales again. You know, we haven't had anybody on there doing as well since Jamie Donaldson really was the last one to win European tour event for us, I think. I know we've had a couple of our local boys have done okay, uh, are still on tour. Reese, but he's based in South Africa now, Reese Enoch, uh, Stuart yeah. Manley. So let's, let's get another one out there, Jack Davidson. So Jack, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the Pirate Podcast. It's a uh, we, we hopefully will get you along to one of our Great Days Golf events and you can show the people firsthand what you can do. But uh, until then, we'll see you again and have a great season, mate. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much. Ah, mate. Top man.